Welcome, I'm Christine and I work at the Granville branch of Kent District Library. And later in this video, you'll hear from my coworker, Miss Melissa, who works over at the Kraus Memorial branch in Rockford. Today, we're gonna to tell you about some new nonfiction books geared towards six to 10 year olds that are located in the second half of our junior nonfiction section. So that's the alphabetized subcategories, holiday through transportation. Now, when we're telling you about a book, Miss Melissa or I might mention a grade um, level recommendation or an age recommendation. This is not at all to suggest that a reader has to be within that range to read or even enjoy the book. We just give this recommendation because right now, all you can see is the cover on the screen. Normally, when you're in a library, you can open up the books, flip through, through the pages, see how many words there are per page, how large are the illustrations, what type of vocab is used, and you can use all of that to make a judgment about whether a book might be a good fit for you. But when you're just seeing the cover on the screen, you can't do that. So we're providing you with these um, age or grade level recommendations just as a starting point um, as you begin to consider if the book might be a good fit for you or your family. Now, don't get too hung up on those age or grade level recommendations. After all, Miss Melissa and I are both well over the recommendations for all of these books, but we absolutely loved them and we learned a lot from them and we hope that you will too. Now, if you hear about something that sounds interesting, we will have a link to a book list on our website that covers all of these books and that link is going to be in the description of the video. The first book that I have for you is called Where Does My Poo Go by Joe Lindley. It's recommended for ages kindergarten through second grade or so, um, though honestly I think older readers can really enjoy this book as well. It has a lot of interesting information to be learned um, and it's a great option for any readers with curious minds. The book starts with the flush of a toilet, actually several toilets. You see some of them up here on the cover. And then it follows what was in the toilet as it goes through the sewer systems and into the sewage treatment plant. It talks about exactly what happens along the way um, in this poo cycle, as the book calls it. And it does a fantastic job of breaking down some pretty complex science into really understandable little bits of information. I learned about how um, dirty water from the sewers can be cleaned by bacteria and reused. I learned about what happens to the poo, which at this point in the process is called sludge, and how it can be reused um, to help you cook food on your stove, to fuel vehicles, or even to be fertilizer when growing uh, new food, which you will then eat and digest, and then it turns back into poo. So it just kind of follows the entire cycle in this book. It has a lot of easy to understand diagrams and it comes with a glossary at the end to help emerging readers learn new words. And this book combines technology, science, and the ever popular topic, poo, um, to teach us more about the fascinating everyday world around us. That is Where Does My Poo Go by Joe Lindley. Next up is The Floating Field, How a Group of Thai Boys Built Their Own Soccer Field. It's recommended for the second through fifth grade level, and it's a narrative nonfiction picture book. So it follows the format of a story, but everything in this book happened. Um, and it talks about a boy named Prosit and his friends. They're all from Thailand, and they absolutely love soccer. Prasa and his friends really like to watch it on the TV, but even more, they like to play it. But they don't get a lot of opportunities to do so. They live in a small village in Thailand called Koh Phen Yi. It's located on the coast, so right along the water. And actually, a lot of buildings are built out over the water and are held up by stilts. And this is because all of the land in Koh Phen Yi is already occupied with buildings, um, businesses, schools, homes. And so they're kind of building out over the water now. And there's certainly no room um, in their village to build a soccer field. So Prasa and his friends come up with a brilliant idea to build a field that will float over the water. And with some help from their community, they manage to do it. And they don't stop there. They actually create a soccer team called the Penny Football Club, and they start competing in tournaments together. 
I love how this book showcases how creative kids are and how this group of kids used their creative problem solving skills and their determination to find a way to do something that they really love. That's the floating field. Next up, I have a new book series that is about traveling and different places that is, comes in a choose your own adventure format. This particular book focuses on London and the reader gets to explore London uh, with this little girl, her moms and her baby sibling. Each location that's featured in this book has a two page spread with illustrated pictures and a paragraph or two of text. Then at the bottom of the page, it will say where to next and give two options, each with a page number telling you where to go if that's the activity that you choose. For example, tour an ancient mystery, turn to page 50, or visit the greatest park in the city, turn to page 56. Throughout the book, there are those little rhymes like mystery and city that really add to um, kind of this playful feeling. And that's how you make your way through the book, by making those decisions. And you won't hit every location and activity in one read of this book. So there's a lot of rereadability, which is super cool. And I love this book for so many reasons. Giving the reader a choice of where to go next and what to learn about makes it feel really, really engaging. And it covers all the well-known sites like Buckingham Palace, Tower of London, St. Paul's Cathedral, Stonehenge, but it also covers a lot of lesser known areas and topics that will be of particular interest to children like Hamley's Toy Shop or Hyde Park, which features the Princess Diana Memorial Playground, which is considered one of the best playgrounds in the whole world. And it's Peter Pan themed. It also includes various areas of the city like Chinatown or Brick Lane, which is the heart of the Bangladeshi community in London and it showcases cultural aspects of London. For example, fish and chip shops, uh, the famous red phone booths, and the black cabs, which are their taxis. Uh, did you know that black cab drivers need to know over 60,000 street names to get their license? It's incredible. Now, if you're lucky to be planning some type of family trip, this book series is a really great way to involve the entire family in planning. But for the rest of us um, who maybe aren't planning a great vacation, this is an awesome way to experience and explore a new city from home. The next book in the series is about New York, and it is also available through KDL. Honestly, this book is going to be a great fit for kids reading anywhere between that second and third grade level and up. That is Little Kid, Big City, London by Beth Beckman, illustrated by Holly Mayer. One of my favorite requests to get um, when patrons are looking for a book is kids looking for real books about creatures from folklore, like fairies. Obviously, it's hard to find real books about made up kids. book of dragons. It is called Dragon World, Meet the Fire-Breathing Beasts of Mythology by Tamara McFarlane, illustrated by Alessandra Fusi. It's a fantastic book to inspire readers' curiosity. It discusses dragons from around the world, and it's fascinating to see how different cultures um, have really different views of them. For example, um, in Asian cultures, dragons are often associated with water, um, when in European cultures, they're normally associated with fire. European dragons tend to be fearsome and destructive, while Asian dragons are sometimes really benevolent and kind to humans. There are also dragons included in this book from the polar regions, from West Africa, Central and South America, Egypt, and Australia, including one that has the body of a kangaroo. This book provides legends and descriptions of dragons from all over the world, um, telling the reader about their appearance, their dwelling places, their powers. But there are also really other cool sections in this book as well, like where to find dragon eggs. Um, what type of jewels are associated with dragons. There's even a section about art, how to design and draw your own dragon. And there are sections with real science talking about how um, there are real plants, animals, and insects that have uh, similarities to dragons. 
This book is recommended for grades three and up. And like many other nonfiction books, there's a glossary in the back to support emerging readers. And the illustrations in this book are fantastic. I wish I could show them to you, but for copyright reasons, I can't. But they just have this fantastical fairy tale like quality to them. And honestly, if you have a dragon lover in your family, it is worth picking up this book just to look at the illustrations. They're beautiful. That is Dragon World. Next is a book called Escape One Day We Had to Run by Ming and Wah, illustrated by Carmen Vela. And it's a collection of 12 true stories about escape. It features individuals from around the world who are escaping different countries for different reasons in different ways throughout different parts of history. The one thing that unites all of these stories is that the individuals in it are incredibly brave and do some pretty incredible things. There's the story of a man who builds his own airplane to escape a communist government during the Cold War. There's a story of a husband and wife author team who escape Paris on their bikes just hours before the Nazis invade during World War II. And they bring along uh, the book manuscript that they're writing. I think you'll recognize what it is. And there's a story of two people who escaped their country by swimming six hours in shark infested waters in the middle of a hurricane. Now, these stories are pretty short. Each one is about one long paragraph. So they really work better to spark the imagination and to introduce the readers to some of these stories that they might want to further read about. Um, but it also works to kind of spark conversations with families about why people choose to move from one country to the other. And what does it mean to be safe? What are ways that we're safe in our life or unsafe? What are ways that other people are safe or unsafe? And is safety um, a human right? And is freedom of movement a human right? This book is recommended for around a fourth through sixth grade age level, but I think younger readers would really enjoy it as well. Um, but it would probably be a good idea if you have younger or more emerging readers um, who are looking at this book to have um, an adult nearby just to help with some of the more difficult words um, or heavier concepts. Now, normally when I'm reading a book about the environment, um, it kind of focuses on the negative impact that people have on the environment, and it kind of has a dismal outlook sometimes. But this next book was totally different. Um, it's really uplifting to read, and it's perfect um, to inspire excitement about scientific innovation and the future. It's called Design Like Nature, Biomimicry for a Healthy Planet. It is full of information about all of the ways people use natural ingredients and have used them throughout history um, to accomplish regular human tasks like dyeing clothes um, or making armor to protect yourself in battle. It also talks a lot about really new innovations um, like gecko tape which um, uses tiny hairs to um, cling to surfaces and it is so strong that a human can use it to climb up glass walls. It also talks about how to use roots um, to make really long lasting and sustainable bridges um, across rivers and um, just has some really, really fantastic information in here. It reads at like a fourth to seventh grade level. Um, and there's a really useful glossary at the end to help readers um, make sense of some of the more advanced scientific vocab. It's a fantastic option for anyone interested in science, technology, um, and the environment. And it's definitely going to make you want to learn more about the innovations mentioned in this book. All right, last up, I have possibly my favorite book that I've read all year. It's called Escape at 10,000 Feet by Tom Sullivan, and it's the true story of a crime, and not just any crime, but the only plane hijacking case in the history of the United States that remains unsolved to this day. It's formatted like a graphic novel, and it has a lot of great diagrams and maps and photos of evidence that will help the reader understand the story and what happened. It's actually the first in a series called The Unsolved Case Files. And I love how the author focuses on unsolved crimes that are both interesting and not too scary or violent for younger readers. It's an awesome option um, for readers who are interested in crime stories and in real life mysteries. And trust me, this one will leave you scratching your head and really, really wanting to know more. That is Escape at 10,000 Feet by Tom Sullivan. 
Now, those are all of the books I have for you today. Um, remember, if you hear about something that sounded interesting, you can click on that link in the description. And now I'm going to turn it over to Miss Melissa for some new um, titles. Hello, I'm Miss Melissa, and I'm from the Cross Memorial Branch in Rockford. And I am going to continue to share great junior nonfiction books with you. I know Christine has shared a lot already, but I have a few that I've found recently that are newly published that I thought you guys might be interested in too. So the first one I want to share is called There's a Skeleton Inside You by Eden Ben Barak. And this is one that is just a fabulous story time book. If you do read alouds or you enjoy doing read alouds, this is a great, it's going to be a big hit with the preschool crowd. It's about two little aliens who are flying through the universe on their spaceship and then it crash lands. But these aliens don't have things like bones or muscles and they can't do a lot of the repair work that they need done to get their spaceship back in flight. So they need your help because you have some of those things they need um, to repair their spaceship. It's a really great introduction to anatomy for, you know, probably as young as three all the way up to like eight year olds. It's really interactive and fun and silly. So highly recommend this one. It's a science book. The next one I've got for you is called Puppy in My Head and it's by Elise Gravel. And if the illustrations look familiar, she is a pretty prolific author illustrator. She did a whole series called Disgusting Critters <laughs> and um, a lot of other fun stuff. She's also written a graphic novel series called Arlo and Pips for Young Kids. So she's got this new one out. Puppy in My Head is an introduction to mindfulness for young kids. Um, it imagines anxiety that children might feel as a puppy running around in their head. And it teaches some really simple mindfulness techniques like deep breathing to help a child identify that they are excited or anxious and to help them calm their body down and maybe figure out why they're feeling that way. Are they scared of something? Are they nervous about something? And um, just kind of, it's a good way, it's, the book is a good way to start talking about mindfulness techniques or just body awareness um, for kids who might struggle with things like anxiety or just any kid in general. So Puppy in My Head by Elise Gravel. I'd recommend it for kids as young as three, honestly, or even as old as seven. It's a good one, again, for the preschool crowd. All right, next up, we have a poetry book. This one's a tiny bit older. It was published in 2020, but I haven't heard it talked about, and it's really beautiful. It's called This Poem is a Nest, and it's by Irene Lantham. And it introduces the concept of nest poetry, which is a lot like found poetry, if you teach poetry or write poetry. But basically, it approaches poetry as a nest of words and thoughts and ideas and feelings that can be built and taken apart and rebuilt in new ways. So the first section of this book is a series of four longer poems about a nest and each poem takes place in a different season. The rest of the book is a collection, and well, multiple collections really, of nestlings, which are poems constructed from words in the first section. So they're long poems in the beginning, short poems constructed from words taken from the long poems throughout the rest of the book. It struck me at first because the cover art is so beautiful but the more that I read it, the more I realized that this would be a really great introduction to creative writing for early elementary. I know when I was a kid, I found poetry really daunting. This makes it really accessible. There's no right or wrong way to do it. You could do it with poems you wrote. You could do it with poems other people wrote. Heck, you could do it with blog posts or news articles or picture books. You could really use this concept in any way. Um, so I highly recommend this for the early elementary crowd, probably even up to age 12. Um, or if you're an adult and you're interested in children's poetry or poetry in general, it's just a really beautiful book. This poem is a nest. 
My next book I have for you is called When Cloud Became a Cloud by Rob Hodgson. And um, it's a really fun introduction to the water cycle for young readers. It's a picture book organized into chapters. And um, so it would be a really great introduction to this, you know, water science for kids who might be really into picture books or older kids who might be really into graphic novels. I read it and I immediately thought of like the narwhal and jelly crowd. Oh, this is a great nonfiction science book for kids who are into short graphic novels like that. Um, also, if you have a kid who is really into fiction, specifically picture books or graphic novels, this book would be a really good segue over into the nonfiction section if that's something that you're looking to branch out into. Um, it's really personable and story driven. So I think that kids who generally stick with fiction would really like this one. All right, this one, um, adorable illustrations, gold foil on the cover. Yep, I'm definitely gonna pick it up. But honestly, it's a really, really wonderful book. It's called A Turtle's View of the Ocean Blue, and it's by Katherine Barr. So in this story, or in this book, Turtle takes us on a tour of all of the Earth's oceans, and it's incredibly well organized. I know that there are a lot of, you know, science books out there right now, especially Ocean Life seems to be really popular in children's publishing, um, but this one really has both the fabulous illustrations and the really good organization and um it's surprisingly comprehensive for a children's book there's not a lot of text on each page and um it still seems to touch on like yeah everything that i would want to introduce to an early elementary ocean unit and a little bit more honestly um if you know miss courtney from our other branches and from um our Stump the Librarian podcast, you know that she's really into ocean science books for kids. And she described this book as the cutest ocean book in existence. <laughs> so that's another vote for A Turtle's View of the Ocean Blue. All right, next up, we've got a social science book. This one's new too. All of these books are relatively new. And this one's called I Rayleigh really is a Dreamer. A True Story by Aureli Morales, a DACA recipient. So this is an autobiographical picture book by Aureli herself, who was born in Mexico and moved to New York City when she was around seven years old. She was raised in New York and um, eventually goes on to become a DACA recipient as a young adult and is still here. Um, the book through both really lush, beautiful illustrations and fairly simple, accessible text walks you through those early years of her life when she was adjusting to living in a new country, going to school in a language that she didn't speak, not having any of her friends and family besides just her parents and her brother in this new country that she was in. It's a really, really beautiful story. Um, I would recommend it for kids ages four to eight, maybe even a little bit older. Um, but yeah, a wonderful, wonderful story. Really well written. All right, my last book I want to share with you is called Marvelous Machines by Jane Wilshire and Andres Lozano. And this one, I can just show you why I picked it. If I can get this out. All right. So it comes with a magic lens. Now, you can probably see that there's this interesting pattern in the middle of this book. And this pattern is used throughout the book to hide the insides of the machines that the book tells you about. But if you put the magic lens up, you can see inside. It's kind of hard to see on the camera. So each two page spread in this book introduces a different place where you would find interesting machines or a different machine itself, like an airplane, a car, um, and you can use the magic lens to reveal what the inside of the machine looks like. It's 
tons and tons of fun. I'm going to keep this one at home because I know my kids are going to want to read it. I think that honestly, children as young as two would just be really find that the magic lens really engaging. But um, I think kids as old as eight would also still really like it. If you've got kids who are interested in how things work or maybe ask like, why a lot? This is a really, really good book that will keep them occupied for a very long time. <laughs> That's all I've got for you guys today. Thanks for tuning in and listening to our favorite new junior nonfiction books for early elementary. Um, don't forget that we always link these book talks um, as book lists in the video description. So if you saw something, but you don't want to have to keep rewinding and figuring out what it was again, you can just look in the video description, click on the link to kdl.org, and our book list with all of these books that we have book talked today will be right there. See you guys soon. Happy reading.